설문지 못 받으신 분 있으세요? 굿아프터 눈, 웰컴 투더 GCF, FAO 앤 UNDP 세션. 안녕하세요. Tips on how to prepare for the competency-based interview. Um, please, uh, Jacqueline, could you please come to the front? Let's give Ms. Jacqueline a big round of applause. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, let's make the session as informal as possible so you can ask questions. Don't be shy in the end. Uh, I don't have my notes, but please bear with me. So uh, as you may mention, I'm Jacqueline Malapita and I'm the recruitment specialist at the Green Climate Fund. Uh, before we start, I'd like to show a very quick one minute video. Um, climate change, it's real, it's serious, and it's up to us to solve it. In the last two decades, we've experienced 14 of the hottest 15 years on record. By 2050, drought and chronic water shortages could impact a billion people, while millions more will be at risk from coastal flooding. It can seem overwhelming, but there's reason for hope. If we embrace solar and wind power to their full potential, we can cut the world's yearly carbon emissions by a third. Already, Germany generates 27% of its electricity from renewables, with a goal of 80% by 2050. Denmark has shown it can produce more wind energy than it can use. And England is building the world's biggest offshore wind farm. Communities large and small are taking steps. A new public building in Mexico City has an exterior that breaks down air pollutants, erasing the effects of 1,000 cars each day. Paris installed street tiles that harvest energy from foot traffic. Other cities are paving streets with smog-eating concrete and sidewalks with recycled materials. Individuals can make a difference too through the choices we make every day. All right. So we've all seen climate change. We all know it's real. Um, you can switch to my um, There. So you've seen it in your Facebook accounts, Twitter links, all of this. Um, how do I go back to the previous slide? There. You've seen it in newspaper reports, in CNN, BBC, everywhere. And as I mentioned, you've seen all the scary looking photos online. But what if there's an organization whose sole mission is to ensure that we go below the two degrees Celsius temperature increase? And this organization is actually based here in South Korea. As a bonus, it's just a few blocks away, if everyone know where the G Tower is, um, it's towards the end of the, the uh, river as, uh, it, that goes through Central Park. This is where we're based. Uh, if I've got your attention, then I hope you sit through the rest of this uh, short presentation as I walk you through our mission, our mandate, and how you can join us at the Green Climate Fund. So we were established in Cancun in 2010 by the Conference of Parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. We have a board uh, composed of 24 members from equal uh, developing and developed countries. They make funding decisions. They make uh, decisions on the operations of the fund. This is our mission. So our mission is as an operating entity and the financing mechanism of the convention and of the Paris Agreement. We help developing countries take ambitious uh, moves towards climate change and to promote a paradigm shift towards a climate resilient development. 
So a quick uh, snapshot of how it all began. In 2010, we were established by the COP, uh, by 197 countries. By 2013, we had 10 billion uh, mobilized to fund projects. By 2014, we started operations here in Songdo. By 2015, we had uh, uh, our first projects approved. And by, by today, actually this figure needs to be updated, we have about 4.8 billion projects in our project portfolio. So we have uh, 4.8 billion approved projects in 96 countries. As you can see in this map, it's pretty spread all over the world. And I'll, I can give some examples of our projects. First is the Acumen Resilient Fund. So it's a first of its kind adaptation fund aimed towards um, helping small scale farmers in Uganda, Nigeria, and Ghana. Um, so these farmers, uh, based on studies, uh, the, the micro farmers own 80% of um, farmlands in these countries and they're most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So this 26 million GCF finance project aims to help uh, these farmers uh, adhere to the shocks of the changing environment caused by uh, climate change realities. Also, aside from that, we have various other interesting projects like creating eco-districts in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. We have solar rooftop projects in India. We have mini grid projects for the DRC. So all these projects are on our website. Uh, all the funding proposals, you can read through them. Uh, if, if you like some bedtime reading, they're, they're gonna be interesting. So now what you're here for is actually how do you join the GCF? Um, anybody here who has applied before? Whether internships, staff positions, consultancies? So I see a few. Um, so we've recently launched our new careers page, jobs.greenclimate.fund. Uh, it will show how uh, the different kinds of opportunities you, can, you, you have to join the fund, whether through internships, through secondments, through staff positions, and through consultancies. So please uh, check this website because we, we have more detail in this website too. So first, internships. To be eligible for an internship, so candidates must either be enrolled in a master's or a PhD program or have recently graduated in one. Uh, we do a lot of uh, career fairs in Korea and we've been very successful with getting Korean uh, interns to the fund. Um, a lot of them also eventually uh, get consulting assignments and staff positions. Although they're not a promise, but it's a very good opportunity to get your foot in the door, to, to see how the fund works, to get to know people, and of course to have an inside knowledge on uh, what is expected to eventually uh, land a consulting or a staff position. So it says here you need to be engaged or recently engaged in an academic study in a field directly related to the fund's work. Since we hire for all across the fund, not just for projects, uh, we hire for ICT, we hire for HR, for finance, for country engagement, for communications. Um, essentially, uh, academic fields related to the fund work is very diverse. It's, it's a wide ranging field. Uh, that's why we get interns from all over as well. So um, you must also have uh, an excellent command of the English language since that's our main language at the fund, and we provide uh, allowance of $1,000 per month, and if you're not based in Korea, we also fly you in to, uh, to join us and also fly you back uh, if needed. <laughs> so you can also check out consulting opportunities, whether short-term, long-term, remote consulting is also open. Um, we, we post the rosters in our website, so we encourage you to apply because once the need arises, we just pull CVs from these rosters and invite people for interviews. So even if you're not available at that particular moment, I would encourage that you put in your application because uh, we, we choose as the need arises. So staff positions. So we endeavor to attract, develop, motivate, and retain our most important resource, which is our human capital. Uh, we offer opportunities for career development at the fund, such as training, stretch assignments, secondments. Um, and we also have a competitive benefits package, including tax-free salaries in South Korea. Uh, for, 
for our staff, we currently have over 230 staff from 60 nationalities. So if you're interested in really working in a multilateral, a multicultural environment, then this is the place for you. Uh, we have a gender balance at the fund, currently at about 55% male to 45% female. We're currently working to, to ramp up more women into the fund, especially in uh, higher positions. Um, also, we provide um, paid uh, vacation days, uh, health package, insurance, and for international staff mobility, um, uh, housing allowance, education allowance, and the like. So any tips? So thank you for coming today because it shows that you're very interested in getting to know uh, not just the GCF but these uh, other organizations as well. Um, I'm sure all, uh, all the panel members can relate that we were in your shoes before. I also attended all these talks about how to land a job in an international organization. Um, uh, I even drove like five hours away just to attend one. So thank you for being here. Uh, I'd like to share some tips. They might, uh, uh, I hope you find them useful, but they're very basic, but these are really what you need to, to, uh, to be shortlisted, to be uh, successful in interviews. So first is to really work on your cover letter and your resume. Uh, we screen through hundreds of applications and it's very, very, very easy to spot someone who just sends in their application in all vacancies that we have. Uh, you need to read through, if you've been to the other um, welcoming presentation, you really need to read through the requirements of the role line by line and try to address how you as an applicant fits the role. For instance, um, I would recommend having a, a cover letter with a short introduction and a two columns uh, where the first column uh, points out the requirements of the role. The second column addresses how you as a candidate fits in the role. So that, that will be very easy because for someone who goes through a lot of CVs, you really have to um, you really only have a few seconds to make a good impression and stand out from the other candidates. Also, please spell check. Um, it's a very good indicator of your language skills, your precision, your attention to detail, and the like. Next tip is to work on your communication skills, not just through the CVs, but also through the interview. Um, it's not just a matter of speaking English very well, but we'd like to see um, how your train of thought is, uh, how organized your train of thought is. Um, I know Victoria will deal, uh, will talk about interviewing a lot more later, but uh, in our interviews, we'd like, uh, we ask a, a combination of technical and competency based interviews. We will be doing some mock interviews later uh, for selected candidates, wherein we will do. Uh, a sample live interviewing session and also a recorded video interview. We have a tool called Sonru, which is a recorded video interview wherein we, s we use it for uh, pre-screening candidates. We send you an email with a link. You click on the email, a question pops up on the screen. You have 30 seconds to think about your answer and about three minutes to record your answer and then the next question pops up. So. It's, it's a very useful tool, but it, uh, if you're new to it, it can be very nerve-wracking, but hopefully the ones doing the mock interview session later will find it useful as a preparatory tool in case you plan on applying to the GCF. Um, we would like to see in your answers uh, a very, uh, your, your train of thought in a sense that when we ask you, for instance, tell us about the time where you showed very good teamwork skills. You walk us through um, a situation wherein uh, there was a problem. You tell us what you did to address the problem. You tell us the results and you tell us what you learned so that you can do better in the future. So we'd like to see a very organized train of thought to see how you will be uh, a good uh, potential staff uh, at the GCF. And lastly, uh, if you don't get the job the first time, please try and try again. We have several staff now who, ha who were hired after their third, fourth, and fifth interviews. 
because it's all a matter of fit. So you may not be the best fit in the first job you apply to, but you may be a better fit in another division at the GCF. So please keep on applying. We even have one new staff member who's been applying for two years and finally, uh, me and Brian were like, finally she got the job because sometimes um, motivation really trumps uh, skills in terms of if you re we can really see that you really, really want to be engaged, you want to be part of the GCF. Sometimes even if you're the one with the most PhDs and most master's degrees, uh, that trumps ability. Um, okay, so can, can you click this thing? So if, if this, if everything I've said entices you, normally uh, we would we would like to show this to you. Our uh, our team meetings are normally more formal, but there are days where staff just goes out of their way to entertain people, and I'd like to show this quick video. If every American driver the presentation is a link. This one. Oh. It doesn't show. Right? Do we have the US? Okay. Sorry, the link doesn't work. But they end up singing through our staff meeting to invite everyone about a concert that the staff are doing to be engaged more to to the other staff members. Anyway, if you have any questions, I don't know if we're doing Q&A now or later. No, later. Okay, yeah. so thank you very much for staying through the, the presentation. Thank you, Jacqueline, for your informative presentation. Um, if you give us the link later on, then probably we can post it on our website so that, sure. oh, okay, because it's personal. <laughs> Okay, um, next, I will give the floor to Ms. Vittoria Vecchione from FAO. Please give Ms. Vittoria with a big round of applause. attending this presentation on the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and, and the career opportunities within uh, FAO. My name is Vittoria Vecchione, I'm an HR officer at FAO and uh, I'm res responsible of the policies and strategies for maintaining and reaching gender and geographic balance within the organization. I hold a bachelor and master degree in uh, law and a master degree in human resources management. I started my career uh, in an agency of the European Commission as an HR specialist and I was in charge of the internship and graduate program. <coughs> then I worked in the private sector as an HR specialist and then I was responsible of the entire selection process for interns and senior and junior position. So um, today uh, we will briefly talk about FAO, uh, our goals, our areas of work, uh, what are the career opportunities with our organization, and also what we look for in candidates, and some final tips on how to apply, how to read a vacancy announcement, how to get prepared for, uh, for an interview. <laughs> So about FAO, uh, FAO uh, is a United Nations agency, a specialized United Nations agency uh, that leads international efforts to eliminate hunger. FAO was founded in Quebec, in Canada in 1945. And uh, uh, our motto is uh, Fiat Panis, you can find it in our logo, logo as well. It comes from Latin and it means uh, let there be bread. Uh, FAO has currently 194 member states, uh, uh, along with the European Union, and has offices uh, in over 130 countries uh, worldwide. Our headquarters is in uh, Rome, Italy. 
Okay, we have a, a sentence from our Director General. Uh, FAO is also a source of knowledge and information and helps developing country in the transition to the modernization and to improve agriculture, forestry and fishery practices, ensuring good nutrition and food security for all. Um, FAO has three main goals, the eradication of anger and food insecurity, elimination of poverty, and sustainable management or not of natural resources. To achieve these goals, uh, FAO uh, focus in particular on these the five strategic uh, objectives. Help eliminate hunger, food insecurity and malnutrition, make agriculture, forestry and fisheries more productive and sustainable, reduce rural poverty, enable including efficient agriculture and food system, and incentive uh, resilient of uh, a life food to treat and see crisis. Oops. No? Oh, do I come back? Okay. These are the, the areas of, um, of work. And these slides could be particularly interesting for, for you. So you can check here if there is something that uh, could match your background and curriculum and if there is something that could interest you. <coughs> so we have the Agriculture and Consumer Protection Department, which works with partners to address the range of issues that affect food from farm to, to table. And the Climate, Biodiversity, Land and Warm Water Department, which has two main areas of fo focus, uh, climate change and land and water. Uh, and they fail support countries to mitigate uh, the effect of climate change and uh, uh, to enhance the agricultural productivity. The Economic and Social Development Department works on social protection, gender equality, rural employment, preventing the child nutrition. And the Fishery and Agriculture Department works to enhance global governance and the managerial technical capacities of members and on conservation and utilization of aquatic resources. The Forestry Department helps nations in managing their forests in a sustainable way. The technical cooperation departments uh, support the achievement of results on the FAO strategic framework. And finally, the corporate services and administration department delivers services and support functions in travel, procurement, and other administrative matters. Then, so why should you work for uh, FAO? This is just a sample of reasons. Uh, so you can bring your contribution to the mandate of the United Nations, work in a multicultural and international environment, gain skills and experience in the field of agriculture and food safety, and also access to networking uh, opportunities. So what we are looking for, this, in this slide you can see uh, the minimum requirements we, uh, we look in candidates. So the minimum requirement you have to, uh, uh, your, your CV has to have for, uh, for applying to pro in particular to professional position and uh, APO program and junior, uh, uh, junior professional program. In particular, we need the advanced university degree in one of the main field of work of the organization. It means that the advanced university degree needs to be related to the work of the organization. Working knowledge of English, French, or Spanish, and limited knowledge of the other two, so, and, or Arabic, Chinese, or Russian. We are an international organization, so it means that we put particular emphasis uh, on the uh, language knowledge. Effective teamwork and communication skills, Willingness to work and travel anywhere in the world. It means that the candidates need to be flexible, both for traveling and also for uh, possible internal mobility. Okay, employment opportunities. We have uh, several employment opportunities uh, uh, within FAO. Uh, and I will briefly present all of them. Okay, we have professional position uh, uh, occupied usually leadership 
function or position requires significant level uh, and technical expertise. These are fixed term position with organization and vacancies at are advertised. Okay. Uh, vacancy are advertised on our uh, website where, when there is the need. General service position includes secretary and administrative staff, but also security guards, nurses, and building technicians. Uh, candidates have to apply to a roster and that's open once uh, a year, and then the, when there is the need of a general service position, the eligible candidate will be interviewed, will be invited for an interview. Then we have associate professional program and junior professional program, which has the target of young people or gra uh, recent graduates in particular. Uh, associate professional program is uh, uh, funded uh, by the government, uh, while the junior professional program is funded by general fund, uh, and the, there is a limit uh, for the for the year. The, um, you need to be 32 years of age or younger for applying to this uh, to this position to this program. Then we have consul consultants uh, are usually short-term employment opportunities, uh, um, and uh, when there is a need of expertise beyond that of a regular staff, also these positions are, are advertised on our website. And uh, internship are opportunity for students and recent graduates to gain international experience and to learn about FAO works. And finally, uh, FAO uh, continually seeks volunteers who are interested in contributing uh, their time towards FAO mandate. Okay, now we, uh, we enter in the practical parts of the presentation. How to apply? So um, you can find, uh, as we said, we, you can find all the um, position advertised uh, on our website, uh, fao.org. There is a specific page, uh, it's called employment page, um, and there are different uh, sections for consultant, professional, general service, interns. And if we can click on the link, uh, in the first one procurement officer okay here we have an example of, of vacancy announcement so, uh, you can see that uh, the, the vacancy announcement has different sections so, uh, in, at the beginning you have the vacancy announcement Thank you. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. you have the vacancy announcement uh, number and the period in which you can apply. So starting and the deadline for application on the right. Uh, then the general information regarding the position, so title, organizational unit, uh, gender, level, so the level, the duty station, the duration of the assignment. Usually all the um, uh, professional position are for two years uh, with possibility for extension. Then, if we go ahead, we start with the, uh, we have the organizational setting and reporting lines. This is the introduction of the vacancy announcement. And you can find here the, sorry. <laughs> um, you can find here the structure of the office, uh, the duty station, and the um, reporting lines. So your future possible supervisor. Then we have other two areas, the te technical focus and key results. Uh, it means that the technical fo focus of the position and the key results, so the results you need to accomplish during the assignments. And then we have the first most important part of the vacancy announcement, so key function. Key function, here there is the list of, a, uh, of, a, uh, of tasks you will perform during your assignment. So here you can understand uh, if it's something that could match your CV and is something that it could interest you. If we go ahead, specific function is 
specification of this, the, the, first, uh, uh, the first section regarding function. Then here uh, we have the second most important part of the vacancy announcement, the minimum requirements. Here you need to check if your background uh, and your knowledge and capacity match with the, with the vacancy announcement. Regarding the requirement, we have the educational background, so uh, university advanced degree could be a ba bachelor and the type of university degree. So in this case, it's law, business, administration, economics. The years of relevant experience, and please note that the years of relevant experience are, are fixed for all the position. It means that for a P2 level, we look for five years of, of relevant professional experience. For a P P3, we look for seven years of professional experience. And then working uh, knowledge uh, of the languages. So in this case, uh, for professional, uh, more or less always the same. So English, French, or Spanish, and limited knowledge of the other two, or Arabic, Chinese, and Russian. Then we have the, comp the core competencies for FAO. And we will talk about them later. We have a specific slides for it, for them. And uh, technical and functional skills. Uh, here, usually, there is a list of, for example, specific tools you need to be able to use for this assignment, a system, or specific language. Um, that's it, because then you have uh, general information regarding also the remuneration. It's a link to the salaries of UN and how to apply there is the link to our system. So we can come back to the presentation. Okay. So this is the slide. Uh, uh, this is the slide saying the, the title uh, the, of the vacancy announcement. So as we said, organizational setting of reporting lines, technical focus and key results, key function and specific function, minimum requirements, uh, competencies, and technical functional skills. So this is the second step. So you check our vacancy announcement, you are interested, and then now you want to apply for a, a position. Uh, and you start your application. Uh, first of all, uh, re mm, mm, we cannot accept spontaneous application. So you need to apply to a specific position through our website. We cannot accept CV via email or in another, in other way. When you fill in your application, uh, first of all, include uh, all relevant information. It means personal details, uh, information regarding your background, previous tasks, uh, previous responsibilities, uh, fill in all of the part of the um, application form. The most important thing, match your qualification, competencies, and skills to the position. Try to highlight uh, your qualification, competency, skill with the, with the minimum requirement and all the requirements of the um, of the uh, vacancy announcement. Be clear and structured. So check the spelling, check to, uh, if you use uh, universal language or standard language, in particular regarding the education. You need to try to use a standard language regarding master and bachelor in, uh, uh, in, in English, not the translation in your uh, language. And finally, attach relevant documentation so the CV, cover letter, uh, certificates, if they are needed. Then, so third step, you have been invited for an interview, and this is a checklist uh, um, with uh, some tips for, the, for preparing for the interview, because uh, you need to be prepared and organized for, uh, for the interview. So confirm time, location, and ask how long you should uh, plan for the interview because if you are working, if you have previous meeting or uh, meeting after the interview, you need to be prepared and uh, uh, schedule everything in uh, during your, your day. Uh, review your printed application and then uh, try to match your qualification competencies uh, with the requirement of the uh, of the vacancy announcement, uh, practice any responses to questions that you might find difficult, find difficult or sensitive, 
based on your unique situation. You can also practice with someone else. It could be useful. Um, and think about what in your background makes you unique as a candidate practicer uh, at, uh, <coughs> and practice articul articulating that and prepare some questions for the final. Usually at the end of each interview, you, you will have time for, for question for the panel. Then, uh, okay, uh, you have been inter uh, invited for an interview. Usually we run um, technical interview, but we have also competency-based question during the interview. Remember that, uh, as my colleague said previously, uh, the, the behavior is the best predictor of uh, future behavior. The past behavior is the future predictor of uh, future behavior. Uh, on internet, you have a lot of examples of uh, competency-based questions. Uh, here we have a couple of examples. Uh, tell me about a situation where you had to motivate a member of your team. This is more for a senior position when you need to manage, manage people. Give us an example of where a strict challenging deadline had to be met. This is quite frequent as a question. Um, then, uh, as I said during the, um, when I show you the vacancy announcement, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, five core competencies uh, for FAO. And these five core competencies are common more or less for all the position in, uh, in FAO, except for uh, the senior position where we require also other values. And, um, these core competences are the resource focus, so take accountability for the delivery of a great result, teamwork, work together within a team, supporting other and fostering a positive team environment, communication, encourage and contribute to clear and open communication, building effective relationship, build and maintain relationship inside and outside the, your team in order to achieve common goals, and uh, knowledge sharing and continuous improvement, uh, continually seek to improve the knowledge, skills of oneself and others. I don't know if at the end we will share, no, we don't need to click on it. Uh, we will share the presentation at the end uh, with, with other people. Okay, so uh, you have the link here. If you want to, uh, you can find this page on, on our web page uh, if you need more information regarding the competency framework uh, booklet uh, you have more details there then finally um, preparation for competency based question uh, as we said uh, when we ask competency based question we recommend uh, to use the star model when you are answering the question this is very useful both for the candidate and for the interviewer. Um, we have four uh, steps during the answer. First of all, listen to the question and start thinking of a specific event. Um, so first of all, we have situation. So describe this, the situation uh, or the event uh, that you were in. Second step is the task. So uh, explain the, the task uh, you had to complete. Uh, third step, the action. Describe the specific action you took to complete the task. And uh, finally, uh, the result. Close with the result of your effort. So for learning more about FAO, you can visit our website, fao.org. Org. I would like to share with you also some figures because I saw it was done previously by my colleague of UN Secretariat regarding uh, national of uh, Korean Republic uh, because currently we have uh, uh, 21 staff members in FAO uh, from uh, national of Korea. Uh, staff member which means professional position and above and general service and there is a good um, gender balance. And non-staff members, 
we have 16 position, we, 16 national of the Korean Republic, it, and no staff are consultants and others, so volunteers, interns, and all the other categories not included in the staff members. So it means that we will, um, will be more than happy to have more application from uh, Korean national in order to increase the number. So that's it. So question on you. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Okay, thank you, Victoria. Uh, last but not least, Mr. Jean-Luc Marceline from the United Nations Development Program. Let's give Mr. Uh, Jean-Luc a big round of applause. Hello, everyone. Oh, sorry, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. It's my second time in Korea, and I hope it's not the last one, because the hospitality of this country is amazing. So thank you so much for being so, so many of you here in this room today. Uh, before I'm going to go quickly into UNDP's um, presentation and also talking about a bit how to apply and all this, I'd like to hear about you a bit. Who is under 32 years of age? No one is lying, okay? Just who's under 32? Okay, we have probably, probably a, a, the larger group here. Who, um, who has a master's degree? Or, or, or more. Okay, so all of you who do not have a master's degree yet, you may really want to get a master's degree because most, most UN positions, no matter whether it's UNDP or elsewhere, will require a master's degree. In particular, if you want to be sent abroad, you know, internationally. So that's a very important point. Who has French? Or some French? Some Spanish, maybe. All right. Those of you who have French and Spanish, you may want to continue brushing up on it and, and really ex expanding the, your knowledge in these two languages. The chances for you to get a job in a French-speaking country are much higher than in an English-speaking country, simply because yeah, there are fewer applicants. So that's something you may want to consider. Um, now, let's, 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 let's zoom into UNDP. Uh, who has heard of UNDP? Really? That many? Well, I'm glad. <laughs> We're not always that known. But uh, this is mainly because we mainly work with governments. But um, as I said, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about UNDP, its mandate and all that, and, and see how you can fit into it. And then I will go a little bit into the application processes, but I will not repeat too much uh, what my colleagues have said, because I would like to emphasize that everything they said was also applicable to UNDP. The UN has one way, basically, to, uh, to, to, to deal with applicants. There may be variations from agency to agency, but at the end of the day, it's, 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 a, it's a standard approach. All right. SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. Anyone has not heard of the SDGs? Well, that's good. Because if you don't know about the SDGs, that's the very first step. When you apply for the UN, remember, it is not applying like a first-time job and I just want to learn and, and all that. You're already coming with an expertise. There are very, very few positions where you are fresh from, from, from graduated from the university. Most positions in the UN will at least require two years of experience. In the case of UNDP, the SDGs is the roadmap of our work, like most, most organizations these days. So it's critical that you're aware of them in, in, in rather good depth, because that will also be, um, the more you know about our work, the easier it gets when you apply. You use the right words, you use the right expressions and all that. So that's very important. That being said, UNDP does not deal with all the SDGs, but we are the agency which deals with long-term development. We do provide advice to governments and other types of institutions in, implement, in developing and implementing policies and strategies to achieve sustainable long-term development. It may sound obvious these days because sustainable development has become quite of a buzzword in the development world, but actually, if you just go back 20 years ago, it was not that much on the agenda. The whole thing was about economic growth, was about putting people out of poverty, but the, the, the whole aspect of sustainable, sustainability, was, was a little bit forgotten. 
or s not yet uh, m matured in, in such a way uh, that it is today. So UNDP has three main pillars when it comes to that, and they all intertwined, of course. A country whose growth is so high, but which forgets about environment, and my colleague Jacqueline here, here talked about all these activities related to environmental projects. Well, that country will, will probably not see the benefits of its, of its incredible growth for a very long time. Deforestation uh, and other natural disasters that may happen because of, of, of overuse or overproduction and all that. If a country has uh, progress on so many aspects, but forget part of its population, maybe a minority, maybe a gender group, uh, maybe a religious group, well, then the, it's, these inequalities, in the end, are going to undermine the, 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 the whole uh, development process. We see a lot of countries where there is growth, but it only benefits a few people. This is not sustainable in the long run. Something will happen at some point. Um, as you can see, all these different elements, as I said, are intertwined. And this is really what UNDP is trying to do. So UNDP is based, and I'm going to go into that in a second, uh, in, in uh, most countries, uh, developing countries, and advise governments on policies in order to achieve these different um, um, uh, ob objectives here. We also have value propositions. I'm not going to go into details here because if you're interested in UNDP's work, you can always read our website. I would rather have some interaction with you and also uh, my colleagues uh, afterwards on questions and answers. But just a few things to say. As I mentioned, uh, UNDP is one of the most uh, present agencies, UN agencies in the field. Um, and this is also because UNDP provides um, support to many specialized organizations in the implementation of their projects. And actually my two colleagues here are from agencies which also work jointly with UNDP in implementing different projects in their, in their respective field of expertise. Um, we are also a neutral agency. I don't know, I don't know if, you, if, you, if you understand that context, but Quite often, the UN is being perceived as a political entity with an agenda, and sometimes this adge some people perceive it as a Western agenda. UNDP doesn't really have an agenda except for the mandate that has been presented briefly earlier. And that um, uh, trust that we've managed to build over time with governments is really something that we benefit from today. UNDP can work on many topics, including human rights-related topics, in a non-confrontational um, manner, even with governments which sometimes may be uh, perceiving UN interference as, as something toxic. And I must say, for example, um, as you may, um, may know or may not know, uh, that UNDP works, uh, has an office in, uh, in um, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Next, next door there. And we work, uh, um, <laughs> among other things, we work actually on uh, uh, food security together with FAO, but we also work on topics related to uh, environment uh, and, and, and others. So we're really present in many countries um, and, and supported by many governments. Because of our field-based uh, approach, we are very, very aware of the realities on the ground. Most of our staff, um, both uh, regular staff and consultants and so on, are based in the field, in some of our country offices or regional offices. I will get to that in a second. That I covered, that we are covering different aspects to, to allow sustainable development. And UNDP has also been playing quite a, a critical role in the implementation, uh, sorry, in the creation and now the implementation of the SDGs. All right, um, UNDP has 18, close to 18,000 staff based, as you can see, in uh, close to 160 countries, which basically means all developing countries. Um, we are, we have offices in different places uh, in some countries, of course, so we are in close to 500 locations. And we're covering more or less the whole spectrum of all nationalities in the, uh, in the world. This is just a map to show, uh, we will not go into details, but to show where, where, where um, 
main offices are, uh, and there are many more country offices in, that, in, in Africa, of course. So, let's jump into the uh, more practical aspects related to, to applying for, for UNDP. And once again, I'm not going to repeat what my colleagues have said. All, all the information they've mentioned are, is totally relevant to UNDP as well, in terms of tips, etc., etc. Um, when it comes to UNDP, and like any other UN organization, you will have two types of profiles, if you want. You will have the programmatic profiles, or thematic profiles, and then you will have some profiles which are more towards uh, operations, if you want, or supporting the programs. So, that's very good news, isn't it? Because it means that there's, there is something for everyone. Last year, in the Korean uh, career fair attended, we had pilots in the room, and I was like, why would there be airplane pilots in that room? I just couldn't ima understand. And then that's because there was an international civil aviation organization, and they need pilots, because the UN used pilots. So it's just an example, from, not from UNDP, but basically no matter what your field of expertise is, I bet there is one organization or one place in the UN that needs, that needs it. And we will be more than happy afterwards when we go to the questions and answers to pick some of your profiles to see whether and how you could fit, of course. When it comes to UNDP, because of the mandate we have, we're mainly looking for people who are specialized into these topics here. So anyone who has studied political sciences or de uh, global development studies or gender studies or environmental studies, all that fits pretty well into the type of profiles we look for. Uh, that being said, there is a huge number of positions which are actually within that part that I've just mentioned. And the good news is, if you are an HR officer with UNDP, you can become an HR officer with another UN organization quite easily because we follow more or less the same uh, human resources rules. And the same goes for procurement and the same goes for the other topics here. So if your focus is communication, let's say, well, actually, the UN recruits a lot of communication officers. And once again, you don't need to be a programmatic expert, but you can come with your, your specialty uh, elsewhere and still get a job there. So I would really encourage you to do some homework there. And maybe one thing that, might, that has not been co covered uh, yet is try to be proactive in the sense that do not look necessarily at the position you will apply for tomorrow but start looking into positions you may be interested in in five years' time, let's say, three, five years' time. And then you look at the type of profiles and expertise we look for. And there you will some, suddenly realize there are some patterns. Same type of profiles are constantly looked for. Same type of experience, field experience, French is an asset, uh, two years in an NGO or, or whatnot. And then you say, okay, what am I missing in my CV? And then you can tick the boxes of what you're missing and you can start working on these. So that in three years time or five years time, your CV is matching the type of profiles you're looking for. So instead of being a bit passive, and, and please don't, don't take it wrong, that's the way I've done it too. Huh? So it's easy for me to say that. But instead of being just like, okay, what's around for me today? It's just like, okay, what will be around for me tomorrow once I've built my CV the right way? That really works quite well, for the UN or elsewhere, by the way. All right. My colleagues have already mentioned, I believe, most of these different profiles here. Um, I would just like to emphasize maybe the Junior Professional Officer Program. Uh, who of you have heard about it? JPO Program? Quite a few, huh? Yeah. Korea is a strong supporter of the JPO Program. It's a great opportunity to gain to gain a, a UN experience in a UN contract. So I would really encourage you, if you're under 32 years of age and you have a couple of years of experience, you may really want to look into the JPO program. As it happens, I was in a panel last week to recruit a Korean JPO and the quality was excellent. So there's competition, but that also means there's talent. So I really hope you will be, one of you will be, or several of you will be uh, JPOs in one of the UN organizations that Korea is uh, funding. That being said, the rest, I believe, is quite, quite similar to what my colleagues uh, have, uh, have mentioned, so I will not go into details here. 
Oh, maybe just mention, I don't know if you, if you were in the plenary earlier, but UNV, uh, United Nations Volunteers, that's also a good opportunity to gain field experience that is very valuable um, in a UN context uh, CV. So um, you may want to look into the UNV program. I will not go into details here, but make sure to have a look at their um, website. Also because the government of Korea funds positions specific to nationals from Korea. So this is a good way to, to get into the UN. Like FAO and like basically uh, most UN organizations, we have a, a set of competencies that are highlighted, if you want, across the vacancy announcements. So they're very close to what uh, my colleague Vittoria presented. Um, here, I don't, need, I don't need to read them aloud. You can, you can see uh, which ones that is. But what does that mean for you? Beyond the buzzword part, and please don't take it wrong once again, I'm just teasing a little bit, but it's true, these words are big, but what do they mean? They mean that when you apply, you need to make sure you relate to them. You need to make sure that your applications, both the cover letter and the, and the um, CV, present your expertise, present your, your skills in such a way that it covers one way or another these skills. Then each and every position you will apply for will have also some technical competencies, which are very important, of course. And this will have also to be covered with your CV and your, and your cover letter. But when in a job description these competencies are highlighted, you need to make sure that you relate to them. And you don't need to reuse exactly the same wording, even though it does help, because it helps the recruiter to see, oh, okay, she's picked that one, oh, that one is there, etc., etc. But try to relate. What is it you've done in your past experience that is related to communication? We all have communication work one way or another, and so on and so forth. We will go into more details when it comes to the questions and answers, but this is really important, not only for UNDP, eh, for the whole UN. Unfortunately, one works for the UN, but one applies for your UN organization. I wish one day we sit here or stand here and I will tell you there's one portal for the entire UN system. We haven't reached that yet. So bear with us, uh, when it comes to UNDP, it's jobsundp.org. Each and every UN organization, most of the time, will have its own job portal. Um, on that job portal, there are different ways to sort positions, but usually the easier is to sort by topics, by, they call it group here. And like this, it allows you to quickly to see, based on your, your field of interest, uh, which, which positions are currently available. And then, when you click on apply, it comes. Oh, you can click to see the job description, which is quite similar to what FAO is doing. Um, and then you can apply f through an e-recruit system online. There are different uh, assessment methods, but when it comes, I would say r the most common ones would be a combination of written tests and competency-based interviewing technique uh, interviews. Same as FAO, if you want. What my colleague from FAO presented uh, is also valid to UNDP. You put things into context, you talk about the action you took, what the result was, and what you learned from it, basically. All of this is online. If you want to apply for the UN, Google it, or whatever uh, search engine you're using, and you will see there's the competency framework of FAO, there's a competency framework of uh, the UN Secretariat, there are many, many places which basically give you the questions we're going to ask. And believe me, having the questions doesn't mean you give a good answer. Because if you don't understand the way it works, it's, it, it, it makes no sense. So practice makes better, definitely. Um, all that is on, online, actually. We, we, we don't want to, to trick candidates. We want actually to get the best out of you. Um, references. Um, be also ready, maybe something that my colleagues have not covered yet, or we have not covered yet. Be ready when it comes to references to put people who really know you. Uh, sometimes one tends to put a referee, someone, I don't know, a director somewhere where you were an intern, or because you think it, it looks good on the CV, and it does look good. 
But then when we send a reference check and the person say, well, I don't really know her or him, oh, it looks less good, doesn't it? So let's make sure you put people who, who you've worked closely with or who know you quite well, because, because that's what we're trying to get. How, how were you at work? Uh, it's not name dropping there, okay? This is it for me. Uh, I didn't go in, on, on purpose into too many details when it comes to uh, the application process because once again it's similar to what was presented before and also because we would like to give some room for questions and answers now. Thank you very much. Thank you Jean-Luc for your um, invaluable presentation. Now we will receive questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand and we will hand you uh, the microphone. Thank you for sharing the idea for the information about each organization. Um, I'm going to ask you two questions for the GCF and one question for the UNDP. First of all, to begin with GCF, um, I forgot the question to ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, GCF also require for the master degree for the internship, but however, is there for the exceptional example for the entering the internships, such as the several working experiences. And second of all, GCF is the one of the non-government organization, but is there, for, is there a relationship or the differences between GCF and then UNFCCC? Thank you. Uh, so, thank you. So our internship policy requires that interns either have a master's or a PhD, or are currently in, uh, enrolled in one. If you don't have a master's, but you have a bachelor's and you've completed it, we have vacancies for locally recruited positions, so um, where we require bachelor's degree plus about two years work experience. So these are support staff within the organization, mostly handling um, team assistant work, HR assistant, finance assistant, researchers, and some analytical positions within the fund. So those don't require a master's, but we do require you to have a bachelor's and a co at least two years experience. And for your second question, uh, we are, GCF is not part of the UN system, but we were created under, uh, as a mechanism, financial mechanism of the UNFCCC. So, uh, I don't know if that answers your question, uh, but it's a separate entity, but we do report to the UNFCCC. Um, we work with them, on, with them and other funds on complementarity and coherence, so we don't overlap on mandates of other funds, and we basically use our funding for uh, what the fund is supposed to do based on our mission alone. I okay. hope that answers your question. Yes. Absolutely. Um, the other question for the UNDP is, yes. thank you for, um, you just said about the UNDP, about your organization, but, but if I have chance to enter for the internship for the UNDP, do they have, like, if I, for example, if I speak more than two languages for bilingual, multilingual, so is there a benefit for the internship for entering job? Thanks for your question. Well, not necessarily, because it, it all depends on the, on the office where you're going to. But if you, if you want to make an internship, let's say in Geneva, where we have an office, that could help. French could help, uh, even though English is used. But usually, you're required to use the, um, or to, to master the, the, la the um, language in the country where the office is. So let's imagine you apply for an internship in Kenya, well, in only English would be needed. But in the longer run, it's always a good thing to have uh, French or Spanish or Arabic, uh, actually, because we lack um, experts uh, who have these, uh, these three languages, or one of these three languages. Um, I'd just like to mention that um, 
unlike uh, the GCF, uh, UNDP accepts interns who are in their last year of bachelor's degree. So I guess each UN organization will have a slightly different uh, approach to internships. That being said, for the time being, uh, UNDP's internships are unpaid. It is changing this year. I understand that they're changing the policy this year, but till I see that, it's unpaid. So rich parents or uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of McDonald hours, but uh, that's the way it is. So French is the second importance then among these English. I mean, it, it depends. If you're specialized in, um, in, in Latin America, you, 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 you need Spanish, for example. But French is, in many UN organizations, French, especially the ones based in Geneva, French will be uh, required at least a basic knowledge of, fr of French. And as I said, in some, um, uh, no, maybe I didn't mention it, but in some countries where if it's the same position, if it's in a French-speaking country, you have fewer applicants. Yeah, I mentioned it that. So, so that helps a lot. And I'm not saying that because I'm French, by the way. Eh? It's just a pure coincidence. But um, Russian can also be sometimes an asset with UNDP if you want to work in Central Asia. Uh, but usually I would say French, then Spanish, then Arabic. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Hi, I'm Su Yun, and thank you for your presentation uh, for all. I have a question for FAO. So I have um, multiple internship experiences, but I don't have um, experience in a sense that, that I had a full-time job. And for the employment history record, do you guys value like internship experiences? As, uh, if, if internship experiences like fit to the job description perfectly, then do you guys value that experience as uh, a job experience for the candidate? Thank you for your question. Um, regarding the internship is not counted for years of relevant experience, uh, so for professional position. But you can apply for another internship uh, within the organization or as a volunteer. Uh, but yes, unfortunately it's not counted uh, as relevant experience. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, here. I'm, I'm the recruitment strategist, just kidding. <laughs> All right. Sure. Uh, I was wondering if, if I just have like, uh, work experience, would I get a mm -hmm. or Thank you for your question. So it will depend on which division you're applying to. So we have a division of support services wherein we hire finance professionals, um, not just finance, but also accountants and the like. So for those positions, we don't require climate experience because they handle the operations of the fund. But if you're uh, someone with finance and climate finance experience, we have the private sector facility. Uh, this facility is the intake uh, of all privately funded uh, GCF projects. So for that, you will need climate experience. But if you don't have uh, any climate experience, we still welcome your application. But I would recommend for our Division of Support Services because that's where it, it will fit better. Um, Mr. Shanlik Marslang, you mentioned that there's very few jobs in the UN for fresh graduates. Oh, uh, you mentioned that there are very few jobs in the UN system for fresh graduates. Um, but I'm sure there are lots of students and fresh graduates here who are interested in working for the UNDP. Yes. Do you have any tips on how to build that initial expertise? 
Thank you very much. Uh, where are you from, if I may ask? I'm from Denmark. Denmark, okay, that's what I thought with your name. But right. it's, uh, you're, yeah. you're probably the uh, only non-Korean here. <laughs> they also have a JPO program in Denmark. So, uh, oh, really? Yes, and a big one at that, mm. so you may want to look into it. Okay. Maybe I should just say first, just one word about these opportunities. I, was, uh, I said there were very few. There, there's actually something called the Young Professional Program, but I don't know whether Korea is underrepresented uh, in the UN Secretariat. No, we're not allowed to apply okay, for there the you UN go. Secretariat. So basically, um, you will have to have at least two years of experience. To build these two years, and then we're back a little bit to what I was saying earlier, when it comes to uh, um, being proactive in your CV. Make sure you try to find a, um, a job which is as close as possible to the type of um, work you would like to apply for in the UN system. Uh, if you're into gender studies, try to find maybe a position in uh, either a think tank, if you're more towards policy making, or an NGO, if you're more towards program implementation, uh, which works on, on, this, on this topic, and so on and so forth. My colleagues may have also, also some, some advice on that. But So in other words, you, you make sure that whatever, you, whatever next job or first job you're getting, it's quite close to what you're going to apply for next. It can be with an embassy. It can be a junior consultant in a consulting firm in the not-for-profit uh, sector. It can be, um, now, now, now I don't know on the top of my head, but there, there are many ways to gain some experience without uh, really being yet an international staff member. Before joining the UN, I worked two years in the French embassy in Cambodia, uh, where uh, I was a junior uh, totally junior civil servant and uh, actually a trainee, more like a trainee type and then I worked three years for an NGO dealing uh, with the HIV and AIDS and, and drug issues. Um, so I had yeah, four years and a half of experience and that's when I could become competitive. Maybe my colleagues want to add something or? Yeah, con consultant, consultancies work quite well. We have a lot of staff who've started with a few years as a consultant and then they, they gain enough knowledge and expertise that they can apply for a regular position. Yes, that's a very good one. There's a division in the Korean government that sponsors interns to other international financial institutions. I just don't remember what, but I'm joining the International Financials, Financial Institutions Career Fair on November 18 and 19, I think, yeah. So, oh, thank you, you're probably gonna be there too. Um, so the government actually sponsors Koreans to become interns in these organizations. You might want to check that. Um, and I think they have JPOs for, for f international financial institutions. So last year we had um, I, I, International Monetary Fund, the AFDB, ADB, World Bank, and the GCF in that fair. So if you're interested, you might want to check it out and register also. So thank you for your informative presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, so I have a question. Um, it could be kind of specific for my circumstances. So I have uh, experiences in uh, working as an internship. Uh, I worked as an intern at one of the UN offices in Geneva and other internship experiences. But what I thought and what I experienced there was that it's kind of hard for an intern to become a consultant and also from consultant to a regular staff. I mean, it, depend, it, could, be, it could depend on their circumstances and also the organization, but that's what I thought. And so what I did later was that I got my master's degree and now I'm on the verge of you know, deciding which path to take. So I was wondering what kind of advice would you give to a person like me who, who is like deciding whether to do another internship uh, from the organization that I really want to work for, for, for the future, or whether I should build another, uh, maybe whether I should work as a full-time uh, staff at another relevant firm and then apply for your uh, institution and organization in the future. I, I want to ask this question to all of you because I acknowledge that this 
situation might be different. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, uh, th thanks for, for it's, it's a very valid question indeed. I would, I would say um, one doesn't prevent the other, uh, but I would say the more paid work experience you have on your CV, the better. If you jump from one internship to the other, this, this does not really build up the CV. It, it builds the CV in such a way that it shows your motivation and it gives a thread of thematic interest. So that, that's okay. But just like my colleague Victoria was saying, we, we don't count usually, uh, we rarely count internships as, as, as valid experience because I can take whoever as an intern, it's the, the selection process is not as strict as when it's a regular position. So you, I would rather have, I mean, that's my personal opinion, but I would rather have you taking a job, a paid job, in a relevant field um, and, and, and gaining that experience rather than doing yet another internship, which, which fair enough, gives you more networking opportunities maybe, but it's still not valid as a work experience on the CV. That's my personal opinion. Uh, Mike, uh, oh, you're not finished. Uh, yeah, it was it was really helpful. And if you, if any of you want to add to that, I would, I would say the same. Yeah. If you've already had an internship um, <laughs> and a good uh, full-time paid experience is available, then go for it. But maybe if there's no full-time positions yet, and you find a really good internship in an organization that interests you then I would rather do the internship than be at home and have that <laughs> gap <laughs> in my CV. Yeah, I would say the same. So the, if the full-time position is in the same field you are interested in, you can ho go ahead. Otherwise, I would prefer an internship in the field you are interested in, in general. So okay. thank you for your clear answers. Thank you very much for uh, every presentation. I'm Ming Kyu Lee. I'm actually going to have a mock interview with the UNDP soon, but uh, I want to also ask some questions before that. Uh, I have been talking with my, uh, some staff in the UNDP Seoul Policy Center, and the staff was giving me some advice that I, if, I, if he looks at my CV, uh, he, he can feel like maybe I'm not really uh, having an experience with depth. I mean, uh, I did my uh, studies in international relations and uh, gender development and globalization from my master's degree. And uh, most of the studies I've done is quite inclusive, and broad, and, and like, it's more about the interrelatedness than like a depth of the one specific field. So uh, after my study, I tried to build also like a uh, uh, experience in like separate sectors, like a, uh, in the public sector and international organization and some academic university and stuff so that I can have a look at the uh, which organization really fits me or also like uh, trying to find some uh, connection between the, all these different sectors to make a cooperation for the common course, maybe sustainable development course. And I, how, do you, how, do you, how do you say in this situation that whether this kind of inclusiveness or broad uh, knowledge of mine can be called depth of knowledge or uh, or do you actually, is it okay for you to have uh, some um, professional or candidate with uh, this kind of broad knowledge? Was it addressed to me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that question. Um, I mean, one cannot expect when one starts a career to be an expert. I mean, by definition, you're, you're still fresh, and it's actually a good thing to have a rather broad understanding of what's going on. Now, across, uh, it, it depends a little bit, two things. Um, over time, you will, get, you will start gaining an expertise. And that expertise can be this broad understanding of things. However, we do recommend that you still keep a kind of, a, you, you, you find one way or another to specialize. And if specializing means I'm specialized in broad understanding of policies, fair enough, but you have to justify that. So you have to make sure that you work and you gain experience on these topics which are broad policy context and all that. Now, that being said, <coughs> there's also um, the, um, I don't know if you've heard about the T, T 
type of um, career where uh, people, some people are more towards broad and some people are more towards uh, um, depth. Uh, that depends a little bit on what you're interested in. I don't view myself as a specialist. Of course, I'm specialist, uh, specialized in, my, in, 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 in many topics, but, but I don't like to view myself as, as solely specialized on something. Some people like to dig, 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 and dig, and some positions require that. So typically, uh, the type of PhD type of positions, these normative policy making type of positions, you need people who really gain a very in-depth expertise in whatever topic we're talking about. If you're more into project management, well, one can say project management is a specialty, and it is, but then you need a broad, broader set of skills. You need to be able to deal with a team, you need to be able to communicate, to manage the project, to manage budget, whatnot. So this is type of a more, more, more broad type of expertise, I would say. And that's perfectly fine as well. The UN needs both. But you need to make sure that you understand the requirements on, on both sides. Um, thank you for coming to Korea through long hours. <laughs> and it's really great to see and uh, listen to the presentation and to know your organization. So I have a question for um, Mr. Marshlin, UNDP. Um, it could be for all. Um, I just wonder what kind of process of working, um, for example, when you do not, you, you said you make uh, policies or you uh, gave the or uh, agency or government, like, what is it, advice? Mm -hmm. um, but it turns out there is no results, or there is some results, but you you guys don't expect, or you know, in a way that you don't like. Then what would you do? What do you do? I mean, uh, just holding, or just? <laughs> oh, that's a tricky one. Huh? <laughs> Are you sure it's for me? <laughs> no We're one all. is recording. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to do a very honest answer here. It can be at times very frustrating to work for the UN. Right. It's not only UNDP, it's yes. for the UN, because sometimes you see progress and then that progress it cuts short but because of so many different issues that may, may take yes, place. Yes, and also long-term yes. things. Yes, and, and I would add to that one extra thing is that you don't even know what your own impact was because long-term development, it's not only UNDP or, or the UN, it's so many different factors, including private sector and, 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 and all that. So you're totally right, it can be frustrating at times. That being said, you, just to stay with UNDP, we are behind most elections that take place in the developing world. UNDP buys, one of the biggest procurement uh, activities we have is to, not biggest, but one of the big ones, is to buy electoral boxes, you know, voting, vo voting urns. It, it says a lot. Each election which is uh, being held in the, in the world, in the developing world, is most of them, 90% plus, are supported by UNDP. If it was not for UNDP's work, there would be fewer democratic elections. I know it's still a huge challenge, and in many places it goes backwards, but if it was not for UNDP and so many other uh, UN uh, entities, we would go backwards much, much faster, if I can put it like this. So it is a constant fight, constant push, and all the progress that we make can be are very fragile. But that's why we need to continue making them. And if you do not have that passion, I think this is really something which is quite important. You need to be passionate about, about the work, because if you don't have that passion, you get quite frustrated at times, I must say. I if my colleagues want to By add the something. way, this is uh, recorded and broadcasted <laughs> live. <laughs> Sorry about Actually, that. It is recorded. <laughs> I will. Uh, hello, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm currently a bachelor student. I have a year left. I'm currently studying education and I'm doing a double major in consumer science. Uh, one of the most um, interesting things about the presentation was you said that we should look for jobs not to opening not tomorrow but in three years. Um, 
And currently, uh, I am doing an internship in an international federation. But uh, you said that internships don't really count as, as experience. And I'm also deciding whether to do my master's or not. But I'm sure most of the people here, they were bachelor students as well. But um, for me, I don't have rich parents. And, <laughs> um, and uh, I can't afford to do internships in most UN organizations because they're unpaid, and which I totally understand. So do you three have any uh, tips for me as a child of um, a non-rich family but who um, is capable of speaking English and a little bit of French and who wants to work in the UN. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I would say that in FAO, the internship are paid. So <laughs> you don't need rich parents. And um, I would suggest to go ahead with the master because it's a minimum requirement for, I think, the majority of the position in the UN system. So. If you have the possibility, there is the, in FAO, there are the, the internship are paid. So it's not a lot, but it's, I think, it's fair. And uh, in any case, go ahead with the master degree. A uh, quick follow-up question is, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, because um, if you don't have rich parents, maybe I was in the same position before, I look for scholarships. Uh, most universities offer scholarships, so in my case, I was able to find um, a master's degree where half of it will be funded by the university and gave me the opportunity to be a teaching assistant, so I got some allowance on the side for some living allowance. Um, so th that may also help you go through the, the master's. I've, I also had classmates who, whose education was fully funded, so it really depends on you trying to look for opportunities, um, messaging schools. Sometimes they're not published. Um, in my case, I w was able to also get a scholarship from an unpublished um, source. So I had to ask the department, are you funding students? And they said, oh, actually, we had this funding coming up. We haven't posted it yet, so we'll offer it to you. So just try to be more... Um, uh, try to use your networks, try to outreach more, be more, more proactive in, in uh, your search for a scholarship. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, because since we are running out of time, we will just receive one more question. Thank you. I have a really simple one like for all of you. Uh, how long does it take? How long does it take to assess the uh, online application? I mean the first round. Because uh, 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 for all applicants, maybe we want to know like how long should we wait it for the notice, yeah. <laughs> uh, usually after the application could be one month for the screening and then uh, for being invited for an interview or in general, you receive a, a, not a notification in one month. This is recorded, but the, <laughs> <laughs> the answer, with the GCF, um, it depends on many factors. Um, for positions where the hiring managers really want someone right away, um, it can be as uh, we do screening very fast and we usually invite candidates for interview maybe in a week's time. But there are positions where we get hundreds of candidates and we really can't afford to do it in a week's time where we, we have to do more screening and um, that will take a, a few more weeks, I would say. Well, UNDP is quite decentralized, so um, it, it, it may also depend from, from office to office. However, I would say one, if you haven't heard after a month, indeed, let's say, yeah, four to six weeks, let's say, then it means that most likely you're not considered. That being said, there are sometimes situations where the, process, the recruitment process is, is put on hold because suddenly there is, there is a question coming up, like the government is suddenly questioning uh, why do we have an office uh, recruiting somewhere there, or the budget is taken, and then suddenly everything has to be put on hold, 
and then a few weeks later or a couple of months later, things are clarified again and then we can restart the process. So it doesn't mean that all hope is lost. But I would say one month, one good month, if you still haven't heard back from us, it's probably that you haven't been uh, considered further in the process. So you really do you notice the applicant whether to go to the next one? At least for UNDP, we only notice the one we are further interested in. And I think, I believe that's the case for many organizations, but I don't know for, for my colleagues. But, so you will not hear back from us except for saying thanks for applying, but you will not receive any further information because we receive hundreds and hundreds of applications for one position. Thank you. Thank you. Please give all of the speakers a big round of applause for their informative and inspiring presentations today. We will now the end we will now end the group session, but please note that the courier booths at the second floor are open until uh, five PM. For those who are selected for the mock interview, please go to the waiting room uh, after ten minutes break. Thank you for your attentive participation and hope to see you again at the next year's event. Thank you. Thank you.